Thanks for having me, Scott, Gray, Jennifer. She's not here tonight, but thanks to Jennifer, St thanks to Stephanie for helping set this up. And thanks to all of you for coming out. Some of you came quite a distance, so grateful to you. And I'm grateful to be here. So three years ago, Gray did talk about uh, the book Christian Worldview, the book we translated from Herman Bavink. Both of these books were published in 1904. Christian Worldview was first, Christianity and Science, which is originally titled Christian Science by Bavink, was uh, published later that year. And this is why while Bavink was early into his professorship at a Christian university, the Free University of Amsterdam, and he was seeking a Christian worldview in the context of the university and practicing Christian science in that context. And so the sequel makes a lot of sense. Um, he says that a Christian university is the embodiment of Christian science as it seeks a Christian worldview. So the Christian university is the domain that embodies Christian science as a person seeks to develop a Christian worldview. And so that's why these two books come together. The second book hones in on how to build a Christian worldview by looking at the concept of science. So there has been a lot of Bob Inc. in this venue under the Neo-Calvinism uh, Initiative. So I'm gonna pass by tonight the life of the man and his context mostly, because that's been talked about a lot in this lecture series and let the arguments speak for themselves uh, you know, the question perhaps tonight is why should you be interested in this book? And it, it is short. That's one reason. That's always good. Um, but it is dense. And there are mountains of arguments. There's themes, threads, subplots, all sorts of things you could trace in it. I want to give you two, focus on two that I think are most important and most helpful to the modern Christian as you try to think about science and religion in the contemporary world and especially about worldview. So uh, here, are the, here are the two. First, science must know its place. Bavink teaches, he says, science must know its place. And then secondly, there is such a thing called Christian science, and it's good. Okay, so first, science must know its place. Uh, let me tell you how in two ways, but before I do that, say something about just what science is, what he means by it. Um, Today, the concept science, as all of you know, describes something in, in my own language like a collective consciousness of authority spoken of in the singular. So uh, Pierce Morgan interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson on the Pierce Morgan show not too long ago, and they called Tyson the man who knows when the earth will end. And Tyson spoke about the big rip, and he said, the big rip, when it happens, that's when the earth will end and human civilization will cease. Now, you look at that and you say, the populace says, that is science. That's science. I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. And that's science. Uh, this is technically pop science, popular science. And pop science is the presentation of scientific investigation of a massive collective of thought to the populace without nuance. That's one definition of pop science. It's what you learn uh, at the beginning of every Marvel movie about the quantum world, right? <laughs> Nifty insights from the narrator's voice with visuals without nuance. And today, that world creates a priesthood of those with real knowledge. And that priesthood includes the 2023, 2023 excuse me, Richard Dawkins Award winner at the Center of Inquiry Bill Nye, the science guy, he's part of that guild. Uh, now, Bavink pointed this out in 1904. He says that while the masses must content themselves with mere sense perception, the technical sciences have exalted themselves to the height of gnosis, a priesthood, where they behold the mysteries of the invisible world as though they see them face to face. Another domain of pop science today that's a little closer to Bobbing's definition of what science is would be something like the TED Talk. So at the TED Talk, you have 12 minutes to explain uh, the insights of a collective community of study with excellent communication skill in fields like effective science. So that's the science of the emotions. Um, so the TED Talks tend to move away from physics and astrophysics and towards uh, sociology, emotion, things like that. The most popular TED Talk actually is, do, do schools kill creativity? That's the most popular so far 
Um, so the TED Talk broadens the field of knowledge and calls things like the science of emotion science. And that's something like what Bob Inc. means by it, except the TED Talk remains pop science because typically they lack nuance. That's been talked about a lot with critiques of TED Talks. Uh, they take the framework, you thought you knew, but in 12 minutes, I'm going to show you that you didn't know. And I'm gonna show you the real secret of life is instead this. Now that's pop science, it's science without nuance. So for Bob Inc., the word science instead refers to the simple idea of methodological investigation using experience and critical reflection. Science is not typically a word he uses for outcomes. So if somebody says the big rip, that's not science, right? Instead for him, science is the process. Science is a word he uses to talk about the process of methodological investigation and reflection in any field with any object of study, not just what you can see or put in a laboratory. So theology is a science whose object is God. Ethics is a science whose object is value. Aesthetics is a science whose object is beauty. History is a science whose object is evaluation of the past based at least in part on ethical judgments already made. And these are all sciences. So that's science. One of the subplots of this book then is that he argues over and over again that science must know its place in two ways. Let me give you two ways that he makes this argument. The first is that the practitioner of science, which can be any of us, all of us, must know that science is not necessary. So that's the first thing. So why? For Bobbing, science is not necessary because it is not the whole of knowledge, nor does it accomplish the goal of knowledge. So another way to say it is that science for Bob Inc. is a way of knowing reality, but not the way, not the final way or ultimate way. Knowledge for him is instead like a map or like a web, and science plays a part in drawing that map and in filling it in, but not nearly the most import important part, not nearly. So let me explain this, um, put some flesh on this. Unlike God, he argues, uh, in whom being and thinking are one, for us creatures, being precedes thinking. Right? So first you are, you exist in your mother's womb, for example, and then later you start to think. Your consciousness arises. And then when your consciousness arises, eventually your self-consciousness arises. You become aware as a one-year-old of your own self, that you are you and not other people around you, not objects around you, you become aware of being you. That's self-consciousness. Bobbing says when that happens, you become a normal knower. And a normal knower is a self-conscious person who can do life, know, know things and function in the world, do life. He calls this empirical knowing, normal knowing. So we begin to investigate our existence uh, we learn to live, we learn uh, to, from others, we observe, we use sense perception, we think. You're three years old, imagine, remember, and you, um, you learn where the snacks are kept, right? So you start climbing up and finding that snack cabinet. That's survival skill. And that's exactly what normal knowing is for. It's for surviving, it's for living. Uh, you have to survive, later you learn to cook. And so we need normal knowing for survival value. Normal knowing gives way in his map to how knowledge develops towards not science, but philosophy. Why? Because we don't just survive, you know, when you're three or four years old and you find the snack cabinet, when you approach, you do it sneakily because you know what you're doing is wrong. And you see, philosophy arises because we don't just perceive and know in order to live or survive, but we simultaneously do those things well or poorly, uh, with truth or falsehood. Every action, in other words, he's suggesting, bears a moral character that is not something we discover late in life but arises naturally with our self-consciousness. So as be we become self-conscious, we become moral knowers as we are normal knowers. We don't just learn to speak, we speak truth or we speak lies. And then we ask, who am I? What am I for? Where do I come from? Who made my mom? all these sorts of questions. We become philosophers. We, we, we know the world normally and we become philosophers simultaneously. 
uh, Oliver O'Donovan, the great uh, theologian at Edinburgh, says that no one needs an introduction to ethics for this reason. You don't need to be introduced to ethics. You don't need a course introducing you to ethics. You need to be inducted into the good life. And the reason for that is there's no introduction necessary to ethics or the ethical life because we are moral beings. Moral life is necessary as self-consciousness arises. The climax of the possibility of normal knowing for Bob Inc. then is wisdom. And wisdom is the application of righteousness and skill to any domain of normal life. It's normal life plus philosophy. All right, so some of you, many of you, all of you probably will know the famous C.S. Lewis quote on friendship, where Lewis says that friendship uh, is not necessary, like art, like philosophy. Friendship is not necessary because it does not offer survival value. But friendship, art, and philosophy are necessary, he says, or rather give value to survival. So they're not necessary because you don't need them to survive, but they give value to the life, to life while you're surviving. Now, Bob Inc. would have a slight quibble because he thinks philosophy arises necessarily alongside self-consciousness. However, what he would add into that space is science is not necessary. Uh, Science is not part of surviving, but it does give value to survival. So Bob Inc. says even, this is a paraphrase, but he says in the book that science only happens when there's plenty of food on the table. Uh, It tended historically for that reason to happen amongst the elite because it is not an enterprise of survival value. Uh, It is an enterprise of lengthy critical investigation and contemplation where your survival is already very likely. That's the only time you can be a scientist. (coughs) Excuse me. We do not have to have RTS, though we're glad we do, right? Um, But we do have to have farmers. We do have to have farmers. RTS gives value to our survival as it explores the science of theology because we have farmers already, right? So let me wrap this up and move on, but a couple key, key ideas that come with this. That means that for Bob Inc., science is the methodological investigation of some object in order to enhance, clarify, correct what we have come to understand in normal knowing. It's meant to serve normal knowing. Science exists to aid normal life, he writes. Science offers a lot, but it is not everything or even the most things in human life. Page 116. Second key here is that That means we can differentiate the goal of science for him from the bigger goal of knowledge. The goal of science, he writes, is the systematized knowledge of the cosmos to aid normal life. But the bigger goal of knowledge is, he says this, to know the truth, the full truth. Uh, He even puts it in the language of rest. He says the biggest goal of knowledge is to rest in the truth, to have Sabbath in the truth, to find that which unites our consciousness, our mind and our heart, the visible and invisible realms in rest. That's the full goal of knowledge. Science only participates at part in that. All right, the second reason that science uh, must know its place is because he argues all knowledge begins with faith. All knowledge begins with faith. So in our time, um, pop science is to the populace just science that singular word. That's not dissimilar to Bob Inc.'s own context. In the early 20th century, there was a portion of society that did believe in the post-Kantian enlightenment frame that science produces knowledge and that knowledge is distinct from faith. So science is knowledge. Uh, Religion is faith. Faith is hopeful belief. It's wish fulfillment. It's a Feuerbachian thesis that still has legs even today. Um, Science tells us what we know. Religion tells us what we believe. And those are not the same thing. Only one is certain. The other is hopeful. So Bob Inc. was one of the earlier Christian thinkers, I think, in, in in modernity to show with such clarity that the claim that knowledge requires empirical experience depends itself on faith. So he's one of the early thinkers to say the claim that knowledge requires an empirical input, that claim itself depends upon faith. 
thereby negating itself. So it's something people say quite often now, but Bavink says it very early in this book. Uh, in other words, that the claim of positivism or scientism is in itself not provable. That's the big idea. So let me explain that for a few minutes. I'll get just a tiny bit into the weeds here. Uh, Bavink trusts common sense, but the common operation of the human faculties. But the reason he does is only because of faith. So he believes in the human operation of the mind and its relationship to the outside world because he believes in God's revelation. That's one of the big ideas that comes across these two books. And so to do methodological investigation for him, he says, you have to trust, you have to have faith. And that faith is multifaceted. So here's how it works. He writes this, the truth, as far as we can know it, contains more faith, knowledge, and assumption than many are aware of or willing to admit. So he says that most of what we actually know as human beings is based on faith in other people's testimony. That would be one of the first ways to say it. Uh, we have faith in other people and their authority, and that's faith knowledge. It's not something, most things that we know are not things that we've ever perceived ourselves. Does Madagascar exist at the present? I believe it does. I, I know it does, but I know it based in a faith knowledge on testimony and authority. Now, more acutely, he says this also about perception. So your ability to look out and see the world, he says, the confidence that we have in that is faith confidence, faith knowledge. So here's how he, he puts it. He says, we carry on in life fully assured, convinced that the testimony of our perceptions give to us the world that exists outside of us. And so we, we know what we see is what we see, but that certainty is not based on the condition of empirical proof. There's no way to prove that what you see is what is there or what others see, that there are other minds around you seeing the same things that you're seeing, yet we're certain of that. And that certainty, he says, is a faith knowledge. So he writes this, this is his definition of faith knowledge. He says, faith knowledge is subjective certainty despite the lack of objective obviousness. A faith knowledge is subjective certainty when you don't have objective obviousness, empirical obviousness. So he says, you can talk about that at the level of testimony, at the level of sense perception. Let me just give you one more and we'll move to the final point. He digs pretty deep here, but he says this, all, all sensory perception is a product of psychical activity and it is very complicated. All right, stick with me on this. He argues in this book that psychical phenomena, the life of your mind, uh, forms a world in itself. And that psychical world does the work of representing the world in and to our consciousness. So in other words, he's suggesting that the world comes to us interpreted. And what he means by that is that we proceed into life, not just with experiences, knowledge of the outside world, but experiences of the outside world that we would label true or false or good or evil or beautiful or ugly, all interpreted through language and culture. And that, that interpretation, that interpretation in these concepts is immediate. And that means he says that the invisible world of concept and idea frames for us, participates with us in understanding the objective world, the world that stands outside of us, all right? So he says, by faith, we know in faith knowledge, therefore, that the invisible world exists. Concepts exist, and we use these concepts necessarily for the interpretation and representation of the visible world all around us. And see, he says, you see, all knowledge begins in faith. More than that, we proceed on the assumption that we are the thinking thing that is thinking. In other words, he says, we proceed on the assumption that we have self-consciousness and that that self-consciousness is reliable, that I really am the me that is seeing the world outside of me. And so all of these faith knowings, he says, are subjectively certain without objective obviousness, and they fail the requirements of knowledge according to what we call empiricism or positivism or scientism. And so he writes that the, paraphrasing, the irresolvable, irresolvable tension between positivism, 
or scientism is that we can only know, they say we can only know by experience, but the self that does the knowing cannot be physically experienced. Uh, it exists in an invisible realm, invisible world. The self does not merely perceive the physical, the human mind perceives instead symbol, law, order, chaos, beauty, ugliness, love, hatred, guidelines, clues, never mere data, chairs and trees and airplanes, power, weakness, authority, and all with wonder or disgust. And so he says, even the greatest mind among us, the geniuses of history, perceive like the rest of us. They are limited like the rest of us with a capacity to know that is lacking and confused and depends entirely on faith in the union of subject and object. And so he says, science, know thyself, know thy place. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing, and briefly, uh, not only does he argue across this book that science must know that it's not necessary, but it's important. But secondly, he wants to talk to us about the fact of Christian science and that it is good. Okay, so let's review very quickly. Uh, science participates then in this map of knowledge. Science is the systemati systematization of the facts of the cosmos. And so if you think about it for him, uh, science is like the geography in your map where you're putting together the pieces of the cosmos through critical investigation and understanding what's within the domains of the map better and better and better in order to aid normal life, empirical knowing, as we called it. Now, you may have already picked up, if you've read him much, that this seeking of the full truth, which is the broader domain of the map, the full truth is just what he calls worldview. So the goal of knowledge is the full truth, capital T, to know it and to rest in it. And that is exactly what he means by pursuing a worldview, seeking the full truth the sum total of knowledge. Uh, worldview happens for him only after a conscious determination to discover the map of reality. So we humans are not all out there building worldviews. Uh, not at all. Worldview is tough. It's a determination that we make. It's to build a map of reality that makes sense of the visible and invisible realms. And most people actually aren't engaged in that enterprise normally. And so the big idea the big idea of this book is that the boundaries and guideposts for knowing anything are framed and founded by faith knowledge first. But the bigger idea of the book for Bavink is that therefore the boundaries of the map of reality or a worldview is also therefore written by faith first. That means that for him, the search for full truth, which is the search for the cause, essence, and destiny of all things, the relationship between the visible and invisible, is founded in religion. In other words, for Bob Inc., religion is what bu builds the boundaries of your map. Science cannot do that, he says. The boundaries of the map are built by religion and philosophy, and the geography in the middle is built by science. It's the investigation of the cosmos. And so knowledge or the full truth cannot begin in science, therefore, and end in discovering the absolute. So he says again, science, uh, knowledge, I should say, full truth cannot begin in investigation of the details of the cosmos and ultimately end in finding the absolute. The astronaut does not go uh, to the moon to find God, right? And instead, he says that full truth, therefore, is faith seeking understanding, the boundaries are written by faith. They're written by the conviction of religion. And he says that that's not just the case for Christianity. Bavink is convinced that worldview always takes their position in relig religious conviction. Each religious confession lays claim, he says, on the entire world. Page 180. Even if a person believes in nothing, he writes, this is a matter of religion. This is a border that's been built. It excludes the supernatural by default. So he says that religion lays the boundaries, and Bavink calls them in this book borders or foundations. All right, so let me close then with this. Two takeaways. Two takeaways. This is a little bit of a trick. Two takeaways because I have more like 12. <laughs> but I can trick you by saying two. Uh, the first, the first, and this one's not a trick. The first is that his argument then is to offer the world 
in some sense, a test across these two books, a test of full knowledge. And the test is something like that building a worldview necessarily brings, should bring unity or reconciliation between the two worlds, the world of the subject and the world of the object, the world of the mind and the world of the heart, the intellect and the heart. Uh, scientific investigation and existential need should be brought, brought together in the path of the pursuit of full knowledge. What we need, he writes, is a worldview that satisfies our understanding, science, and our inner life, the heart. We need a worldview that best fits the needs of both. We need a worldview, he writes, that reconciles and makes peace between the subject and the object, between the normal and the scientific, the invisible and the visible. So he's, he's suggesting then that worldviews must be tested and the test is something like, does it fit the demand for the union between the parts of existence? Does your worldview fit reality? Does it fit reality best? Is what he's asking. Does it cause fracture between these domains? Does it cause fracture between your own self, between your head and your heart? So he doesn't in this work argue for Christianity from rational proof first, but he argues that Christianity builds a better map, a map that fits reality better, a, fa a map that union, that brings together in peace uh, the subject and the object. And so he says that rational proofs, therefore, are a product of scientific investigation and pieces of that geography that are incredibly important, important that help uh, build up the boundary, if you will, but they can't ultimately build the border. Faith does. The border is built by religion, an encounter with the living God, a subjective faith knowledge that is the product of a changed heart, an encounter with God's revelation by the Spirit. Uh, but when you look at the map, you see it's the best map. You see, this, you see that it's the map that fits best. Secondly, the close, I said I had two, but here's the trick. Um, because there is a Christian worldview whose boundaries are built by the confession of the triune God, we can and should, he suggests, speak of Christian science, not just Christianity and science. And what he means by that is we can speak of benefits that Christianity offers to the domain of science, how a Christian map best aids the investigation that happens within the geography of the map. So here's the trick, I'm gonna give you 10, but I'm just gonna rattle them off and then leave you to read the book, <laughs> yeah? And we'll, we'll be done. First, what is Christian science? Well, he, he reminds us that the gospel is a set of historical propositions to be believed about Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, but the gospel is not only that. So the gospel is that, that Jesus Christ saves sinners. But the gospel also affects everything. And so he, you can turn to a place like Colossians 1, 15 to 17, that by the Son of God, the world was made, and for the Son of God, the world was made, and through him and to him are all things, meaning that he is the mediator of both creation and new creation, and all has been given over, new creation, to Jesus Christ the King by the Father. This is, he says, a world historical claim, a worldview claim, a boundary drawing type claim. And so he says, the gospel builds the boundary. Jesus Christ builds the boundary of our map. It tells us, uh, it tells us about the world historical. And so here his argument is, is that the gospel is first a set of historical propositions to be believed in about what Jesus Christ has done in history for us, but then it becomes a lens or map through which we view everything else, including science. And so he makes this audacious uh, claim. He says, the banner of the gospel must be displayed over the world of science. Second, uh, and they're gonna get faster and faster, by the way. Uh, Christian science then believes, therefore, in God's revelation. So that's what makes it different. Uh, the truth himself has revealed truth. God himself, who is truth, has revealed truth, the, the ability to know things. And so the goal of knowledge is ultimately to know the truth, God. And so he writes, all science, therefore, is the translation of the thoughts of God as he has laid them down in his works. And so science then finds its principle of being, the reason it exists in the revelation of God, and also its terminus point in knowing 
God and all things in his light. Uh, so he writes this, uh, Christianity in the first couple of centuries was, became, he thinks, the true philosophy by which he means science. Christians, the real philosophers, they knew reality and truth. They knew who God was. And now equipped with this knowledge, they also had a different and better insight into the essence of the world, of nature, and of history. All right, third, the gospel offers the reality, he argues, of an eternal incorruptible truth that stands objectively apart from all human subjects. It communicates that there is truth, that it can be known, and that truth is not a mere interpretative product of my own mental activity. It exists apart from me, and I can know it. And God's revelation gives us the foundation for that, teaches us why that is. Fourth, as mediator of creation, then, the Son of God upholds the two domains of knowledge, subjects and objects. He does this by the word of his power. As mediator of redemption, he pronounces that God remains for both domains, the subject and the object, consciousness and the world. And so we can trust that our certainty, our faith certainty in our representations, our perceptions are real because of the mediation of the Son. Fifth, in the resurrection, we're assured by God that nature will remain forever. That Neil deGrasse Tyson's end of the world account will not give way to the end of human existence or the natural order as we know it. And so by God's covenant promise, there will be a consistency in nature and natures until Christ comes again, which gives the groundwork the possibility for scientific investigation. Six, the cosmos is worthy of investigation because it is to be loved, because God loves the world. And since God loves the world, his people should love the world. And we should be serious about pursuing pathways to knowing it more and more. Seventh, the gospel offers science the posture of modesty, that there is always more to know, that mystery is the lifeblood of science, that every discovery opens to us a world that we don't understand, even as we grow in understanding. Eighth, Christianity saves human knowing from all one-sidedness. It does not fall prey to the subjectivism of the worst forms of idealism, where knowledge is shrouded in the unknown veil of subjective interpretative anarchy. Nor does it fall prey to the positivism or empiricism where one can never claim to know anything they don't see or perceive with their senses. Instead, it unifies the knowledge we have of the invisible, invisible worlds and gives us certainty and modesty at the same time. So a brief note, Bavink saw uh, the Christian benefits for science quite frequently in this book as a third way. He often treats it like that. There are many third way theses throughout this book, none of them have anything to do with American politics. It just so happens. Uh, ninth, Christianity protects all the sciences. So Jesus Christ gives history, for example, a right to exist and be called a science as much as biology. Is history an eternal meaningless progression of time, repeating the miseries of those who search for a will to live, a never ending supply of uninterpretable events? No. Uh, it is full of misery, true, but it's never without meaning because of Jesus Christ. Lastly, 10th, all the while Christianity gives us the power to receive the good from non-Christian scientists because of God's wonderful gift of common grace. So he writes on page 85, he argues, Christians do not have the right to look down with contempt on the investigations and outcomes of science or to barricade themselves in, to shelter themselves away from them. Why? And he says this, because the God who you call Father and Lord makes the same sun to rise on the just and the unjust. And so for Bavink, godliness is profitable for all things, including science. Thank you.